Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. If you could grab a seat. Welcome everyone. It is so wonderful to see so many colleagues, friends, uh, those here in the room with us and those joining virtually. I am delighted to welcome you today. As Associate Dean for Research and Faculty Development here at the University of Denver Graduate School of Social Work, I am uh, privileged to have the honor to host uh, the installation of Professor Kimberly Bender as the Wynn Professor of Children and Youth. And before we go, <clears throat> excuse me, too much further, I want to share um, Dean Amanda Moore McBride's regrets. This evening, she so wanted to be here um, in person with us, but had a family emergency that she needed to attend to. Um, but I know she's, she's here with us in spirit. Um, and I also wanna give a lot of thanks to those who put this event together and supported it, especially Ash, who's adjusting my microphone so nicely. But um, I just like to give a quick round of applause for all the hard work that went into this event. So some have said that the purpose of an academic is to poke holes in other people's buckets of water. Of course, that sentiment was supposed to mean we're to be critical and think about theory and research and scholarship and how we could build upon that and do better into the future. And I feel like many of you with us today who have a PhD uh, might have been trained in that same sort of logic, that the, we are in a posture of an individual expert and trying to know more, do better than the next. Professor Kimberly Bender is the antithesis <laughs> of this ethos. She is the consummate giver of water. Metaphorically, she aims to fill other people's bucket of water by revealing and increasing that water for all of us. Her expansive view of what is evidence and how it can be gathered is a model for us all. All of this is going to get a lot more clear for you during our program, and I'm confident that you're going to walk away inspired, as I am, to question how we approach social science and social work and how we can move from this model of an individual expert to one of a collective expertise to the benefit of us all. I'm delighted that joining us today is the University of Denver Provost, Mary Clark. As Provost, her role in a professorship installation is to officially install the professor, excuse me, professor by putting a medallion around the recipient's neck. In true Kim fashion, she questioned the history of this and the necessity and deemed it a bit antithetical, in fact, to the very points that she will be making in her talk with us today. Provost Clark has been a stalwart supporter of the school, as well as the university's teacher scholar model and its commitment to public impact scholarship. And I am delighted that she is here today to recognize Kim. I would like to invite Provost Clark to the podium. All right. Uh, well, thank you, Jen, and thank you all. It's so lovely uh, to see you today. It's a very, very special day, and congratulations to Dr. Bender. Uh, it is just uh, fabulous to be able to congratulate you, to provide my heartfelt, uh, warm congratulations. This is a um, due recognition of your expertise and your accomplishments, all that you've done to date, and really all that you will be doing moving forward. I love your reframing. Huh. I love your reframing of the uh, from I to we uh, and what Jen just said about the medallion and throwing the medallion aside and really focusing on the community. Uh, so that is uh, something that I honor and also uh, just uh, take real pleasure uh, from, from seeing you do. 
With that in mind, uh, I think of this installation today and the recognition of your work uh, as reflective of the regard that I hold for GSSW more broadly. Uh, those of you who were uh, with us last Wednesday when we announced Dean McBride's transition uh, know of the high regard that I have for GSSW in terms of the instructional work that you do, the support of DU and of the Denver and Colorado communities in the broader Rocky Mountain West, and of the research and scholarship that you do, which is in service of, in support of uh, these concentric communities that I was just speaking of. So when we celebrate your installation today, Kim, we are also celebrating uh, the social work uh, and what it means uh, to our community. So when I think of your individual commitment uh, to DU and to our students, the roles that you've served, uh, the work that you have um, engaged in on behalf of our masters and doctoral candidates, the work that you um, pursued as the interim vice provost for research, the work that you have been doing here uh, within social work, the work that you've committed to in uh, co-chairing the search for the next dean moving forward. Again, it's this uh, reflective relationship between your work and that of GSSW uh, and back again. So it seems like a natural uh, to be installing you uh, in this endowed professorship, the WIN professorship. Um, I'll conclude simply by saying how important endowed professorships are uh, to the university. Uh, first and foremost, it provides due recognition to our faculty and to the work that they do as teachers and as scholars. Uh, it is due recognition. It also is a very helpful support uh, for our teacher scholars in providing discretionary funds that they can use to engage in their research. And we'll see today that that research is in broader support of our community. Uh, so uh, this is a lovely moment to celebrate uh, Kim, celebrate Dr. Bender, celebrate our endowed professorship, celebrate the work that GSSW is doing. And I'm thrilled to be here with you. And I think now it's back to Jen, uh, who will uh, introduce our, um, our highlight of this afternoon. So thank you. All right. Thank you, for Provost Clark, uh, Professor Bender, Kim. Uh, I know that you maybe were hoping that we wouldn't do this, but we're going to. Uh, we're going to talk about you in a lot of detail. Uh, and in an attempt to summarize what really is an amazing career, um, which I expect will continue for many, many years forward. Um, but to summarize your impact so far, I offer a few points of distinction for our audience who may not know all of these accolades. Uh, so first, Kim is a member of the Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare, which is an honor society, our highest recognition really in social work for any scholar. Kim's been named a fellow of the National Institutes of, for Health and the National Institute for Drug Abuse, as well as multiple fellows programs here at DU, including Public Impact, Public Good, and Project Excite. Kim was recognized by DU's Faculty Senate with its highest faculty award, the Distingu Distinguished Scholar Award, and has received every teaching, mentoring, and service award there is to get here at GSSW and has been recognized by her alma maters for her excellence, including the University of Texas at Austin. I'm a fellow Longhorn, so it's, <laughs> we have to do that. <laughs> and the University of Colorado at Boulder. Kim's been involved nationally in, in informing leading initiatives in our field, including the Grand Challenge to ensure healthy development for youth. She is among the top 2% most cited social scientists in the world, according to Elsevier and Stanford. So it is no wonder, as Kim has authored and co-authored nearly 150 peer-reviewed publications in top journals and books in social science and co-authored three books. I love how co-authored three books is like a little dovetail there. <laughs> Kim has secured over 3 million in government and foundation funding to generate those publications and to support the training of nearly 50 master's and doctoral level students 
and her early career faculty uh, who she supported in her research. Kim has served on nearly every committee at the school and has served in multiple leadership positions, including her current role as co-chair of the reappointment, tenure, and promotion committee. She also served as associate dean for doctoral education and hosted a conference at DU for doctoral students across the US on interrogating their training and how we in social work can and must do better in critical pedagogy and in our scholarship. One of those participants was so impressed uh, that GSSW was engaging in this critical discourse that they joined us in faculty this year. I used that last example to highlight um, really Kim's approach to her work, her scholarship, and she has a lot of distinctive achievements and those achievements truly matter. But perhaps what matters most is the way that she has done this work, the how. And as she has evolved across her career as, and as a scholar, how she's really given to many others along the way and brought them uh, along with her. She has always embodied the heart of a public impact scholar, one who is community driven, not just community engaged, one who has recognized that the very components of the scientific method have centered historically the expert instead of the communities that we aim to impact. From the research question to the design and to the methods and even the interpretation of research, she has worked to decenter that expert role. She's not poking holes in other people's buckets of water. She is now rather serving as a model for future scholars. Today's doctoral students, assistant professors, and I would include myself in this group, look to her for guidance and as a model for something more than logistic regressions, peer-reviewed publications. It's about those who want to deeply have their scholarship matter, including the very process of generating that scholarship. So it is fitting that Professor Kim Bender would be installed as the WIND professor today. So Philip and Eleanor believed in the power of research in its capacity to maximize human potential. Nearly 30 years ago, Phil and a group of local businessmen began a partnership with the University of Denver, known as the Bridge Project, which was developed to support youth and families here in Denver and, and uh, those living in Denver's public housing. As Bridge evolved and changed, the Winds wanted to ensure that the research would continue. And so they endowed the school's first professorship, which was held by esteemed Wind Professor Emeritus Jeffrey Jensen, who joins us this evening. The Bridge Project itself officially closed in 2020, both as a consequence of the pandemic and also a model that wasn't sustainable uh, into the future, but the work still continues. Professor Kim Bender ignited a phoenix in the development of the next incarnation of Bridge, the Mutual Aid Collective, which you'll learn more about shortly. In my capacity as Associate Dean for Research and Faculty Development, um, and for all that Professor Kimberly Bender has done to inspire our imagination with what is possible in social work and social science and in our scholarship, to give the opportunity to future social workers and scholars to sit next to and learn from community members and partners, to develop social science for action and for public impact, to be supportive and a, to be a supportive and generative colleague. It is my pleasure to install Professor Kimberly Bender as the Win Professor for Children and Youth at the University of Denver Graduate School of Social Work. I hope you will all join me in congratulating Kim on all that she has achieved and welcoming her to the podium. Good afternoon. Thank you, Jen, for your words and for stepping in on Amanda's behalf. And thank you for Amanda helping to get together some of those thoughts and to Provost Clark for 
this honor um, and this endowed chair. And a special thanks to Ash Ahrens, who's up out of their seat again, um, for just pulling this all together. This is one of our first um, hybrid uh, events and just such attention to the authenticity of what and spirit of what we were hoping to do today. I remember sitting in this large wooden desk in my private office as I started a new faculty role um, on faculty here. And I had absorbed many messages um, before I came. And those messages were in my training program. They were in professional conferences. Um, they were in the air that I breathed as I was becoming an assistant professor. Um, prove yourself that you're worthy that you're here. Prove that you deserve to be here. Produce. Write peer reviewed journal articles. Lots of them. As many as you can, really. Follow the formula. Write efficiently. Create research with rigor, which in my training meant be objective, be independent, be first author on those papers, or better yet, solo author. Develop your own research agenda, be a principal investigator on your own funded grants, preferably fund federal funding. And my work at the time was mostly doing surveys of young people experiencing homelessness. Um, I investigated many possible risk and protective factors that young people experience. And then I put them into logistic regression models and we cranked out results that indicated what made young people more at risk for substance use or made young people more at risk for mental health challenges. And we identified trauma as a major risk factor influencing the work. And I collaborated with many bright scholars across the country. This is a figure that the library put together that displays those collaborations um in the early years each circle is a collaborator you're not meant to read all the details but you get the picture <laughs> some of them are inside the institution some of them are out some of them are students and some of them are faculty colleagues but honestly it's hard for me to track my findings across all of these papers they somewhat blend together for me and it's harder for me still to see the influence of them on our social work practice i was writing at the time mostly for science and if I'm honest, for surviving in the academy. I went on to develop interventions. I aimed to reduce trauma among young people who are unhoused. And one of the interventions helped young people in the shelter to use mindfulness to identify risks in their environments and then problem solve their way out of dangerous situations. Um, young people weren't opposed to mindfulness. They actually really liked it and found it um, a nice way to cope with the chaotic environment where they were living. But after a three-year randomized trial, I was disappointed to find that the intervention had no effect on their safety. So in reflection, there were significant pieces of the work that I wanted to rethink. The study funded by NIDA focused on changes at the individual level. It required young people rather than the context or services or condition to change. So while young people might have had more skills to detect risks, they were still living in dangerous and oppressive situations. And the study and funder required a manualized intervention, one we developed based on theory and prior research, but that had little input from the young people themselves. I felt a little like I was building a Jenga tower in my work. And it was one that was delicately balancing on like a single peg. Prove yourself, do it all, compete, produce. And I felt these pressures even amidst amazing mentorship and support from colleagues who were doing really stellar intervention work, um, Jeff Jensen, Heather Tausig, and De Prince. And they were helping me to use their energy and wisdom to help me navigate this landscape. But the tower I was building was tall and wobbly. And I should mention that early in my assistant professorship, I also got pregnant with my first baby, Grayson, and my second, two years later, Poppy. These were Jenga blocks that significantly tilted my tower. This photo was taken um, at like the grocery store electric horses on like an <laughs> endless string of snow days where we were running out of things to do and I just kept pumping pennies in to try and keep them in. Poppy was less than enthusiastic. <laughs> My partner Trey and I, despite having a lot of helpful family in the area, still sometimes ascribe to this take care of yourself mentality. Work travel, child care, well visits the doctor, sick days off, appointments, cook, clean, also somehow engage in extracurricular activities. 
our life became an intricate family schedule of drop-offs and pickups and coverage. There were benefits to this capitalism-infused approach. At work, I was earning the currency of our field. Publications, many of them, led to funding, led to notoriety and promotion. I was supporting doctoral students and newer colleagues and also being productive, boosting their capital to navigate the academy and gaining skills on the way. And I was advancing knowledge in a certain area for those scholars that read and cited my work. I brought the institution notoriety and funding. And personally, I had a pride in quote, doing it all and appearing as though we were handling it all from the outside. But there were also considerable drawbacks, many of which have been noted by others before me. Overproducing can mean diluting our knowledge. Dr. Matt Howard, a prolific scholar in his own right, gave a talk that I'll never forget before he passed away. He pointed out how difficult it is to answer some of social work's most pressing problems, not because of lack of evidence, but because of its proliferation. With so much pressure to publish many papers, we were flooding databases with these narrow slices of knowledge in academically written dense papers, and the impact on our social work practice was minimized. Instead, my colleagues, my colleagues, Dr. Shannon Sleva and Jen Greenfield, have taken a lead in calling for elevating public impact scholarship in social work. They call for research that's based in community in which findings are shared directly with community members through things like blogs and social media and podcasts and op-eds. And my colleague, Dr. Ramona Beltran, has pointed out in her writing that when we adhere to these white Western norms around individualism and productivity, we often overemphasize our quote, original thinking and ignore the fact that knowledge is collective and is actually passed down through lineages. It's also important to notice how my early work felt to me as a researcher. I felt pretty removed. I was positioned as a studier of a social problem and a group of young people that I was not directly in relationship with. I certainly didn't partner with them or have the input, their input into making decisions and making sense of the problems, how they were experienced by them and how to address them. And personally, like many in our work, I was tired and stretched too thin. Trisha Hersey, a writer and activist and founder of NAP Ministry, talks about how this is by design. The frantic grind of individual product production encourages separation from our emotions, from our bodies and from one another. I hope to spend the rest of our time together sharing a little bit about how I saw my work shift and importantly to highlight the emerging scholars I see going about this work quite differently. And doing so, I invite other social work scholars and social workers to consider their place in this evolution. My work changed significantly when I began to do more participatory research. This work involves co-designing and carrying out research in partnership with those most impacted by and experienced with the social problems that we study. As a team, and I'm important to have all their names up here, we ran a series of photo voice projects in a local youth shelter. These projects involved young people coming up with their own questions, taking photos, discussing those photos, and making recommendations. The project ends in an exhibit where learnings and recommendations are shared with family, the broader community, and in this case, staff and administrators and board members of the agency. This is a photo from one of those early projects in which young people shared messages about the need to reduce stigma and see them for more than their housing experience. And I remember getting a little bit teary-eyed when I announced this exhibit at faculty meeting, and I remember being surprised by those tears because clearly this work put me in different relationship with both the problem and the young people who were experiencing it. Shortly after this, I got a call from folks running a peer support program for young people at the Colorado Coalition for the Homeless. Peer support involves employing folks with lived experience, in this case, experience of homelessness, recovery from substance use and mental health challenges to support young people currently facing these adversities. This team, um, their names are shared here, of peers, peer supervisors and administrators was interested in studying peer programming. They wanted to use their research both to improve their own program, but also to publish work for other folks who wanted to do peer programming. Um, they'd seen our previous photo voice work and they wanted to collaborate on research that used the same participatory method. So we launched into what would become four years of co-designing and carrying out a participatory research study together. We aim to understand the experiences of peers and the young people that got support from them. We co-designed the research questions and methods 
we collected and analyzed interview, journal, and photo voice data together, and we packaged it for different audiences. Just to give you a sense, we would meet, we still meet every week for two hours. In the first 30 minutes, we set aside to check in, to be together on a human level. We heard about one another's struggles and celebrations and spent time in community together. We paused frequently to interrogate our process, how to make decisions together, what values to center in the work, whose voices were missing. Much of this work was funded through federally, federal AmeriCorps research funds, but through a specific call for participatory research. And our findings tell a story about how peers approach supporting young people quite differently than conventional services. And I'd like to share a few examples. Conventional services typically begin with an intake interview. This is where an unhoused young person is asked a series of personal questions by a stranger to determine if they qualify for services. In contrast, I'll read you some of our findings. These are written from the perspective of the peer. <clears throat> when I'm in the very beginning stages of building a peer relationship with a young person, I will often just hang around in places where young people spend their time, like the drop-in center or the shelter or other public spaces. By doing this, I'm hoping to show youth that I'm available to talk if they want, but that they don't have to. As I hang around, I've learned to do kind of a dance, figure out when to enter or when to stay out of conversation. I've also had to get comfortable with silence or the pull to quote, do something helpful. Sometimes I really am just standing there. In those moments, I remind myself that becoming a familiar face and having informal conversations is a critical part of relationship building. Conventional services typically offer a case plan and agenda developed by the agency prescribing next steps for young people to seek treatment, education, housing. And when young people don't abide by this plan, they can be viewed as unready for change. In contrast, peers describe, youth may make choices that wouldn't be supported in formal services. I've been there. They might not show up for groups or appointments. They might put themselves in what could be seen as dangerous or unhealthy situations. Maintaining a non-judgmental attitude is the most critical skill I can offer as a peer. There's no three strikes rule. If someone does, misses an appointment or doesn't meet treatment goals, I try to understand and meet youth where they're at and to offer acceptance even during times when their decisions are difficult for me to make sense of. This can be hard. As humans, we all have judgments and frustrations and disappointments. Youth are so used to having authority figures be disappointed in them. So I have to create a safe container for non-judgment including not judging what others might think of as a failure. I failed too, maybe even in similar ways. I try to normalize their experiences, sometimes sharing my own. Conventional services ex expect young people to navigate a system mostly on their own. In contrast, peers walk alongside young people, acknowledging the ways that our service system can be oppressive and advocating for it to change. Again, from our findings, it's hard for almost anyone to walk their journey alone. I try to offer young people the chance to get support with tasks or skills that might feel, they might feel embarrassed to ask others about. Peer relationships can be a safe place to play catch up or practice backstage in a way that feels accessible and not shaming. There are a number of things that young people may want support around. We can practice hard relationships, take a new bus route together or anticipate what a job interview will be like. And if something is frustrating or confusing about their experience, we talk about it. Young people have to jump through so many hoops to access certain resources. The bureaucracy of these resources can feel almost nightmarish. And when we ran a series of photo voice groups where young people took and discussed photos that represented their relationship with peers, they described feeling uniquely supported, believed, cared for. They described the relationship as, quote, deeper than therapy. They felt like a weight was lifted, that they could shift directions in their lives with support. Young people felt that they mattered. They felt loved. Peer support disrupted many of our conventional service norms, norms that were not unlike the norms I had absorbed as an early career scholar. Prove you are worthy or eligible to be here, show you can accomplish success on your own, follow a prescribed manualized way forward. Peer work was addressing the trauma our earlier intervention had aimed to address, but in a much different way. Peer support assumed everyone was worthy of care and support that no one can go it alone, that acceptance and relationship rather than adherence and perfection were the goals, and that young people should be directors of their own lives. This photo is our team walking on the mall in DC while we were there to present findings at a conference. And I share it because the work wasn't always easy and we had missteps 
as we work to unlearn and not replicate the power dynamics of conventional research. In this photo, we were walking right before dinner and we were at a conference that was, had consistently elevated me as the researcher and presenter and my team as community partners. And over dinner that night, I advocated that we all present at the conference, assuming that equal participation was the goal. The next day we did so, and while this felt great to one peer, another felt incredibly uncomfortable as they were forced to present. This led to conversations about how it feels to be in traditional research spaces, often unwelcome, and how to determine if it was worth it, whether we each had a true why to participate in different aspects of our work. This research has um, had a much broader reach and the impact has been more practical. Although there are fewer of them, our publications have been downloaded more often and more broadly in educational settings, but also in governmental and commercial spaces. Our website offers practical tools providing guidance for peers who are looking for peer positions and for agencies hiring peers. We received a contract with the city of Denver. They employ 70 peer navigators and have contracted with us to work as an advisory group of peers and peer supervisors to create an action plan to support peers equitably. And we were invited to participate in strategic planning with the state of Colorado who's just dedicated $6 million to supporting peers as part of the behavioral health workforce. So back to my analogy, this work required a dismantling of the Jenga tower. The work was conducted in solidarity and partnership. It was developed in response to a need identified by the community. It centered those most impacted to carry out the work, which meant centering meaningful questions and action. And the tower wasn't yearning to be quite so tall and wobbly. Rather than quantity of publications, we yearned for depth. And here I wanna pause, insert a snapshot of the scholar who helped to make this work possible. I'm told her mom might be on Zoom. <laughs> making more visible the fact that I was doing this work not only in partnership with the community, but also with other scholars who are making the work better. Danielle Whitman is a relatively small person who tends to expend, extend the spaces in which she sits. She comes to her research career as a writer, an artist, a playwright, as a community worker and a facilitator of participatory spaces. Danielle contributed to the peer project in many ways, but there's two I wanna highlight. First, she transformed our writing into creative nonfiction. She took somewhat sterile lists of themes and paragraphs, academic writing that our team didn't feel all that great about, and she helped us to transform it into first person narratives, exemplifying themes with deeper embodiment. Second, she turned the spotlight inward. She investigated how our participatory team navigated power, encouraging us to make power more explicit and developing a tool to help us do so that she now has publicly posted for other teams to use. Danielle's in the midst of her dissertation, and it's just so cool, I wanna highlight a little bit of it. She looks up and she sees our surroundings and believes that we can change our spaces or build new ones to be more welcoming and affirming. She believes young people should be centered as co-creators of these spaces. So Danielle created a tool for co-design. Her Futures of Third Places game as part of her dissertation was developed iteratively. First, it was a spark of an idea then she got feedback. Then she said she, quote, added more fun. <laughs> then she pilot played it and adapted it again. The game invites young people, for now those living in permanent supportive housing, um, but she plans to expand it to other contexts, to consider example scenarios and then design spaces using Play-Doh and pipe cleaners to address their needs and wants, to hear others' ideas, to world build together. For example, one card describes the experiences of an unstably housed young person who's looking for a safe place to nap during the day when they haven't slept well at night. Another describes a young person's experiences of being surveilled while eating their sandwich in a park. Another card simply describes a young person's desire to have a place to just dance. In playing the game, the academic researchers learn what young people desire in spaces that are affirming in terms of architecture, arrangement of spaces, and in terms of quality and nature of interactions. And the young people have input into design, sharing their perspectives on spaces being built or reimagined. Danielle just ran this game with 23 young people um, in Grand Junction at a permanent supportive housing program. And while we typically have a really hard time getting young people to participate in interviews, she had more participation than she had planned for. She heard young people discuss the desire for a youth-focused community center with a coffee shop that gives coffee in exchange for goods rather than money, that has a dance hall for drag shows, 
and it displays a giant calendar that celebrates community members' birthdays. Danielle plans to adapt this game as a tool for other youth spaces like community centers, after school spaces, public spaces, to craft environments affirming to young people. As my Jenga analogy had collapsed, and in preparation for this talk, I asked Danielle for an analogy of how she thinks about research. After some thought, she said, it's kind of like weaving. There are different threads, but they're created through weaving in different perspectives and voices collaboratively. To engage in this weaving work, Danielle shared she needed permission, an open space where her ideas could be shared, explored, embraced, even when they were half-baked even when, or especially when, they expanded beyond conventional notions of research and scholarship. She also needed permission to bring all aspects of herself into the work, rather than splitting herself into different versions for different spaces. And then in March 2020, COVID hit and everything slowed down for a bit. Mutual aid proliferated. People started delivering groceries and medications to their immune compromised neighbors. People came together to make masks to share in their community. Spaces popped up online to connect those who are more isolated. The US has a long and rich history of mutual aid, particularly among communities that have been failed by our systems of power. Mutual aid centers solidarity, caring for one another because as abolitionist organizer, Maryam Kaba puts it, we recognize that our well-being, health and dignity are all bound up in each other. This way of caring outside the system created new social arrangements, as Dean Spade says, is a political act. And as this practice of mutual aid spread much more broadly during COVID, Danielle and I pulled together a research team of GSSW faculty, staff, students, alumni to understand the moment through research. This is a long list of contributors involved in different stages of the work, certainly a collective effort rather than an individual one. We interviewed mutual aid organizers around the state about their values and beliefs and practices. Organizers shared about mutual aid providing a sense of hope and nourishment in the midst of such strain and early stress in the, in the pandemic. They described mutual aid removing the stigma of needing help since everyone had needs and everyone had something to give. They shared that the experience of being able to make change, to have power through care for one another, felt like a liberatory practice. Our team recognized that mutual aid and social work share a mission to promote racial and social justice and end oppression. But we also saw clear ways that our social work profession often diverges from mutual aid principles. While mutual aid involves neighbors helping neighbors, social work positions professionals as experts to help, quote, those in need. While mutual aid is for everyone, social work typically requires people to prove they are eligible for care. While mutual aid engages the sharing of human experiences, social work emphasizes maintaining strict boundaries. And while mutual aid prioritizes being responsive to needs as they emerge, social work is rarely so nimble. These are tensions we're exploring in a new mutual aid fellowship program at GSSW, where five MSW students are doing their internships in organizations offering mutual aid. We meet weekly in seminar to think and dialogue and sometimes even collage together about how communities can meet needs outside of conventional systems. We think critically about how social workers can act subversively to better meet community needs. We have honest conversations about how social work can be part of the solution to the complex problems of our future. And at the same time where social work is complicit in creating the conditions that necessitate mutual aid. The fellows are working in, with three partnering organizations providing support for mutual aid locally and their work will be spotlighted tonight. I'll share more in a bit. I'll pause here again to introduce another scholar in this collaborative work. Zeen Dunbar has a calm and bright energy about her, a sense that she is solid, fully aware of the pain in the world, and yet somehow still hopeful. She loves the magic of the academy as we gather in our regalia at graduation. She imagines a sci-fi secret society for building knowledge, having conversations over the generations. Zeen comes to her work, herself an immigrant to the US, having spent many years supporting mutual aid among immigrant and refugee organizations and finding community in DIY spaces. I've met with Zine mostly over Zoom and she sits in this giant chair that looks like it was taken off the Star Trek set. And it's really appropriate because it sometimes feels like she's like lifting us off into another realm. Zine recognizes that the social problems we study are bigger than all of us. Her goal is to gather more people to question our assumptions about who deserves what 
and who is responsible for whom. Dean led a group of us through understanding what mutual aid organizers imagine for the future, like in the next 10 years. Organizers described multiple future scenarios. Futures where mutual aid must continue to proliferate amongst growth in population, production, and consumption, and the, unassociate, the associated unmet needs and inequality that come with it. Other futures where mutual aid steps in when existing governmental and social systems collapse as they buckle under massive needs of complex crises of the future. And transformational futures where society experiences a profound paradigm shift, creating accountability around power and privilege and responsibility for one another, and new forms of social exchange and collective networks emerge. In publishing this work, Zine helped us imagine artifacts of the future that would convey these complex topics. We landed on a message board of the future. This became the findings of our paper. What if the government apologized for the way COVID was handled? The result was a series of messages using participants' words from interviews and conversation with one another. Hard conversations about how mutual aid could be sustained and fear of it becoming professionalized. When I asked Zine what analogy she would use for her research, she shared her work is a potluck. We all come together. We bring a random collection of stuff to feed everyone. No one is in charge. The community has responsibility for feeding the whole. There's enough for everyone. No offering is insignificant. Zine also describes being a scholar as being in conversation with lineages of other thinkers. These voices offer different perspectives, dissenting voices to share in an abundance of deep thinking together. When I asked Zine what allowed her to engage in work this way, she said two important pieces. At the center of her work is accountability to herself and the community. She's done a lot of work on herself to be self-assured in her own voices and values. She's a check for herself as to whether she's creating work she feels proud of, that feels good in an affective way. Underneath the pressure, urgency, culture, competition is just a responsibility to herself and to do work that she feels proud of. Second, she's let go of her perfection. Her work is iterative, calling back to open mic nights where she bravely shared her work, heart done, and waited for the immediate feedback of an audience sometimes nailing it, sometimes falling flat, iterating, learning, developing her ideas in conversation with others. Finally, I wanna introduce one last scholar. Dr. Jennifer Wilson is both the spark and the glue of any gathering. She used to bring warm chocolate croissants to our doctoral seminar at times of stress. And then as if that wasn't enough, she'd like pull out this sifter and put powdered sugar over the top of it. <laughs> She shines so bright that it lights other people up. Jenny came to her work after years of working in housing alongside individuals and families seeking care and support. She was invested in thinking through innovative solutions to address housing and homelessness. She and I began collaborating on engaging community to think about social innovation for homelessness, ideas that might break free from our conventional responses to very sticky problems and address unacknowledged pain points in our system. We partnered with others Ellie Edelman, Drs. Jonah DeChance and Math Rutherford on a series of civic hackathons and a human-centered design course, all framed around innovations in housing and homelessness services. When it came time for her dissertation, Jenny came to study tiny homes. Tiny homes are an innovation where folks experiencing homelessness have their own small separate dwelling within a village. And then the homes offer a shared community space and make decisions about governing their community. Tiny homes were popping up across the country, including one in Denver that Jenny was studying, but research was, which takes a long time hadn't caught up. And without best practices, it was difficult to grow or even scale tiny homes as an innovation. Yet Jenny was aware that a wealth of knowledge existed in communities implementing tiny homes. So Jenny used her dissertation to design a process for gathering information from the field among those early adopters of an innovation and synthesize it down to a few key characteristics or conditions necessary to maximize their impact. First, she read all the gray literature, which essentially means everything on the internet about tiny homes, to generate a list of nearly 100 characteristics of tiny homes. Then she created this card sort exercise where she partnered with panels of experts, those running and living in tiny homes, to sort these characteristics as to whether they were absolutely essential, useful, or not recommended. 
And last, she interviewed field experts in a variety of villages to see how accurate and useful the new list of characteristics was. Her work clarified, for example, that it's best to have a bathroom in each house to allow animals to ask all residents to attend regular village meetings, among other characteristics. The result is a report freely available to those implementing tiny homes, a report that her community partners have posted on their websites and shared with folks new to the work. I asked Jenny about analogies for her work and the answer she, first answer she gave me was that she developed, developing her research focus was like using a metal detector. It involves spending a great deal of time in community spaces and listening for even sensing what questions were most relevant, what research would be most useful or responsive. The second analogy she gave me was an art installation by Yoko Ono. This was first exhibited in Japan in the early 60s entitled Instruction Paintings. So Yoko would send instructions written in Japanese to the gallery to be posted and shared. Um, for example, one piece shared, drill a small, almost invisible hole in the center of the canvas and see the room through it. By allowing gallery attendees to make the work in their minds or in their homes or in the galleries, her work challenged whether art was a product or an idea and questioned who is really the artist. Rather than a solo artist at the center of the work, Jenny was part of a chain of people working towards a shared goal. I asked Jenny what allowed her to do this type of work and her answer surprised me a little. While we as her dissertation committee had encouraged her innovative and creative work, she described being torn between drafting hundreds of pages of scholarly dissertation for us or spending energy on more deeply creating tools for the community. Ultimately, our academic system with the power to grant her degree was front and center, which meant less time for community response. She shared, researchers need to have a moral compass guiding their work, a constant holding of who they are responsible to in the community. It also wouldn't hurt if the products for the academy aligned more clearly with the products for the community, so scholars weren't forced to choose between the two. And this is when she dropped her biggest critique in a side whisper. I wish we'd stop talking so much about public impact scholarship and social work. It's a bit embarrassing. This shouldn't be something special and extra we do. Shouldn't it be everything we do? So I wanna acknowledge my own privileges to approach the work in the ways I've just described here and to collaborate with such vibrant scholars. As a full professor, I've jumped through all the promotion hoops. Tenure has created space for me to engage in work that doesn't center conventional metrics. I report to a dean who has directly advised me to quote, unlearn the formula and to step back and support and elevate others' work, the needed permission that Danielle alluded to. My skin color, able-bodiedness, cisgender, and educated family offered me advantages to not only meet the conventional metrics, but also to take risks to challenge them. Yet we can change our structures to center those values and expectations and norms in our social work organizations and schools. You must send a message that counters concerns of eligibility and worthiness. If you are here, we're invested in you and your success. This feels critical in overcoming the sense of competition and scarcity that leads to individualism. You must send messages of permission. You may and are encouraged to challenge traditions, encourage creativity, curiosity, critical thought, and imagination. And we must value responsiveness. You are accountable to the community as much or more so than to the institution. And we can shift our metrics to reflect this. And we must stop perpetuating the more is always better mentality, but rather assess quality by interrogating the ways our work is conducted, whose voices are centered and the impact it has. And we must encourage collaboration, stop perpetuating this myth of individualism. We will certainly have times when we take lead on things but to imply that we should do this alone does a disservice to the work and it burns people out. Rather, rather we should give credit where co-creation is evident. I'd like to end with a personal story because I think we must bring more of our humanness into these spaces and share the ways that we're both givers and receivers. The pandemic was a particularly hard time for our family because my younger child, Poppy, who at the time was seven, was diagnosed with a Wilms tumor. She would endure a major surgery, radiation, and a year of chemotherapy. And I'm grateful to share that she's now more than a year and a half post-treatment and doing well. <laughs> but in her diagnosis in the year that followed, that earlier facade of we've got it all together quickly fell away. It opened me up to collective care like I'd never experienced before. Neighbors, friends, friends of friends started to care for our family. 
We had meals, childcare for my son, therapy referrals, check-ins, a community seeing our elevated need and meeting it. This is a picture of a, of a piano that one of our neighbors donated and our neighbors trying to move this down the block to our house before the winter set in and we were moving a social distance. It's apparently much more difficult than you would imagine. It's a very dangerous thing to do. Um, my colleagues started picking up responsibilities, no questions asked. Jen, Belli, Jen Bellamy took my advising load. Eugene Wall stepped in to support the doctoral program. And I felt a shift in myself, even though I had been writing about the importance of collective care, I had not fully embraced it until this moment. The earlier messages as I sat in my office as an assistant professor had been ingrained in me for a lifetime. Do it all yourself, be independent, self-sufficient. But with Poppy's illness, I started to answer questions about what we needed with honest answers. And I realized that doing so brought joy and meaning to everyone. As Poppy's situation started to stabilize, we started a collective care pod. Friends and neighbors could indicate how they were on a weekly basis on a simple Google form. They shared their stressors and their joys and indicated what, if anything, they needed. This practice has ebbed and flowed just as our needs have, but it has kept us in touch through bouts of COVID, relationship struggles, and work stressors. And it's opened us all up to being a little more interconnected. Not everything has been positive. As school started up last fall, we were in the midst of the pandemic. This was before vaccinations for kids, before mild or Omicron variants, and Poppy was still immune compromised. And I'll never forget attending an online forum for the school board debate about whether kids should wear masks to school. Our system had decided to appeal to public opinion rather than to guide their response. Parents complained about their kids having to wear a piece of cloth on their faces as uncomfortable and unfriendly, while I knew my child couldn't attend in-person school without a collective level of protection. It was clear to me that many of our systems do not emphasize collective responsibility, but rather individual freedom, and we're leaving people behind. To end on a positive note, I want to tell you about Flory. <clears throat> Flory has been our nurse at Children's Hospital for the past two years. She has a loud, low voice that fills the hallways of the pediatric oncology unit. Several months into treatment, Poppy was invited to contribute to a fundraiser by drawing a picture of her superhero. A professional artist would then take that drawing and blow it into this big, beautiful glass sculpture to be auctioned and raise money for pediatric cancer research. Poppy drew a picture of Flory, which I thought she got the hair like pretty right on. <laughs> Um, and she was right on to choose Flory because Flory has been a real hero to all of us. Flory has two teenage sons, one who plays lacrosse and had a recent ACL injury, and another who went away to college and spends a lot of time at the gym. Flory misses him dearly, but she's doing her best to give him space. I know this because Flory tells us about her family when we see her, and also because Flory can track her son on his phone. <laughs> At our visits, Flory would share all the information about Poppy's labs with us, and then she would look at our concerned faces and cup her hand over her mouth and whisper, trust me, I'll tell you when to be worried. She was on our side. She knew and cared about us. Of all the things, Poppy's least favorite part of treatment was having to drink a jug of contrast liquid before CT scans. It took us hours to drink that stuff. And at one point, there was a miscommunication, and Poppy ordered the wrong scan for Poppy. Flory had required her to drink the jug unnecessarily. And prior to the scan, Flory met us in the waiting room with tears in her eyes, sharing her mistake and apologizing to Poppy and us. She said it was important that her patients trust her, so she must be honest about the mishap. When the gala approached, our friend Jill came to us with thousands of dollars of small donations from dozens of our friends and family to purchase, purchase the sculpture and give it to Flory as a thank you for caring so well for Poppy and our family. I share this because it represents on so many levels how we can better care for one another, whether personally, professionally, or politically. Flory engaged with us in a deeply relational way, not only as a professional, but as a fellow parent, as a human. She acted subversively within a medical system, admitting when she was wrong and prioritizing trust. And she offered care and solidarity not unlike the peers of the coalition or the mutual aid organizers in COVID. Our community was interconnected. Flory's care sparked more care. We were responsible for one another, particularly when the system left us, left us behind. 
And the truth is we are interdependent. Not only do we need each other, we all have something to offer and we all have something to receive. We've got to let go of individualistic mentality that must strive to produce endlessly and independently. Do the deep work zine refers to, to, to be solid in ourselves and know our contributions need not be at the front, but need to feel good to us. We need to be explicit about whom we are accountable and responsive to. True and work as social workers and social work scholars, we need to be in solidarity with community, prioritize collective wellness over individual successes, co-create more responsive scholarship and action, infuse joy and play and imagination. And we need our systems and structures to change to honor that messy, fluid work, to elevate it for the value and insight and change it promises. I'm gonna take just a couple more minutes of your time. In the spirit of mutual aid, I wanted to tell you a little bit about what we have around the room for you tonight. Um, we've modified tonight's experience in a few different ways, thanks a large part to Ash's coordination. Um, as you collect your food out in the lobby, you'll see that we've purposely asked that the food be prepared in a way that allows us to donate it to Denver Community Fridges. And you can learn more about that um, table at your table when you pick it up. So all leftovers will be donated there. We've also redirected the use of funds for the medallion, and I'm told a chair that I was supposed to get for my office, um, and party favors for you all to instead go towards our three mutual aid community partners who are represented here tonight. And I just wanna give you a really quick intro to their work. Mutual Aid Monday is a grassroots organization advocating for unhoused neighbors. They meet Monday evenings to serve community meals and distribute heaters, insulation for tents, blankets, sleeping bags, and more. They support people emotionally and with food and coffee during city sweeps, which are traumatic displacements happening two to three times a week in our city. They also visit people in encampments, particularly during cold weather, making sure residents have supplies, medical care, and support to find indoor sleeping if they want it. Angelica Village, who I think is here with us tonight, is an intentional community offering comprehensive and unconditional support network in community living spaces. Um, they promote health and resilience through love and care and sustain mutual support. Members of their community include children, youth, and families seeking refuge from war, youth and families exiting homelessness, individuals engaged in healing work, and those with special needs and abilities. And they invite volunteers to support tutoring, mentoring, gardening, child care, and rides, and donations of groceries and household supplies. And then finally, Lifespan Local purchased a Westwood Redeemer Lutheran Church in February of 2021 after years of deeply listening to the local neighborhood assets, talents, and wishes. And they currently offer many community facilitated supports, including parent education, early childhood education, maternal health home visits, and food access and justice work. And their offerings and many others will continue after the site is complete in 2023. They are welcome applications for volunteers and donations to support their multifaceted work. So I invite you to read more about their work, to chat with those of them that, that can be here. Uh, Ash has created QR codes to learn about how you could get more involved in their work if you're interested. Thank you for being here tonight and for all your support and please join me in some food and drink.